John begins his gospel with a hymn of praise, which was used in his community. He also inserts references to John the Baptist, which is also part of what he needs to do as he begins his gospel. I have backed those references to John the Baptist out, and we will be hearing only what we think is that original hymn of praise to the Logos. Listen for the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness we have all received, grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only son who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. May God add a blessing to this reading of God's Word. So it is important to recognize that this passage from Isaiah that Claire read comes in the context of Isaiah's call to be a prophet of God. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. We've been following this story for the last three weeks and looking in it for um, a pattern to guide and shape our worship. The first week we looked at Isaiah's response as he entered the temple and saw God sitting high and lifted up on his throne and his robe, which is the symbol of his sovereignty, filling the temple. As he enters the temple, his head goes back and his mouth opens and he is aware of the awe of God, the awesomeness of God. And then having become aware of the awesomeness of God, he becomes aware of his own lack of worthiness to be in this space. And he says, he falls down on his face and he says, Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. And now he knows the two things that every person needs to know when they come into the presence of God to worship, that God is great and vast and awesome and mysterious and that we are not. So it's very strange that he should say, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips, from a people of unclean lips. Why is he focused on his lips? I mean, 
How much trouble can you get in with your leaps? Certainly he is a man of unclean other things as well. A man of unclean hands. A man of unclean heart. A man of unclean mind. Why does he focus on lips? And I think the the hint that we get is that this takes place in the context of his call to be a prophet. And the purpose of prophets is not to foretell the future as we tend to, to focus on, but rather to speak the word of God to the people of God. Sometimes that word is bad news. You've missed the boat. You've misbehaved. You're going to be in big trouble if you don't change your ways. Sometimes the word of God is a word of hope and comfort to a people who are overwhelmed by their misery. Comfort, comfort ye my people. You have received double for all your sins. Your warfare is accomplished. He is probably a person like any of us who has struggled with what it is that God is calling him to be and do in the world. And now he is having this vision from God which is clarifying what it is that he is being called to be and to do in the world. And because he has the sense that he's being called to be a prophet, he is focused on the unworthiness of his lips to speak the word of God. And what happens next is that one of the seraphs takes a pair of tongs and lifts a burning coal from the brazier that's on the altar. And he carries it, not daring even to touch it himself. And he lays this burning coal on Isaiah's lips. And he says, now that this thing has touched your lips, your guilt, which is the part of sin which separates us from God, your guilt has been sent away. It's been banished. And your sin has been blotted out. It's still there. But God has chosen not to see it. So what is, I mean, this is a dream, this is a vision, so it's metaphorical, there's symbols in it. What is that burning coal that touches Isaiah's lips? I want to suggest to you that the thing that is touching Isaiah's lips and which transforms him into an unworthy person to someone who is worthy to be a prophet of the word of God is, in fact, the word of God itself. Isaiah is under the misapprehension that his unclean lips will defile the word of God, and that's at the root of his fear and his unwillingness or his hesitation to become a prophet. This action in his vision makes clear that it is the other way around, that it is the word of God that will cleanse and transform his unworthy lips into a worthy vessel. His lips are powerless to defile the word. The word is powerful to transform his lips. And that is what happens in this worship setting. And it is the dividing line in this story. Everything that comes before it is preparing for this moment. And in that moment, Isaiah says, And yet, I'm a man of unclean lips, and yet I see the face of Of God. And when that hot coal, when the word of God touches his lips, he in fact sees the face of the king. And he is transformed into a prophet. And it's at that point that he's able to hear what God is asking Who shall I send? And it's at that point that he's able to respond, saying, Here I am, send me. And it's the word that changes everything. Which is why 
In Reform worship, which is what we're kind of thinking about these last three weeks and next week as well, in Reform worship, in Presbyterian worship, at the very core and center of our worship experience is the Word of God. Everything that happens at the beginning is preparing us to hear it. And everything after it is preparing us to go out into the world and share it. And at the center is the Word of God. So, when we say the Word of God, what do we mean? What are we talking about? Back 34 years ago, I, um, I was being examined on the floor of uh, the Presbytery of the Western Reserve, which is the one where Cleveland is. And a member of that Presbytery at the time, I don't know whether he was in attendance or not, was Claire Brewer, it was that old stone Presbyterian downtown Cleveland. And uh, so I don't know whether you remember this or not, Claire. But uh, I got a lot of softball questions because, you know, a lot of the elders and pastors are moms and dads. And they, they, you want the promising young man to look good and not feel bad about himself. And so f- I was getting these, you know, these kind of uh, softball questions. Which is kind of annoying, you know, because I just spent a lot of money and three years of my life preparing to answer really hard questions. I mean, I was happy that people wanted to be nice to me, but, you know. Until this older guy who was sitting way back in the corner in the very last pew on the left-hand side, I can still see him. He stands up and he sort of looked like Burl Ives. Remember Burl Ives, you know? He was one of the first guys to wear a goatee beard long before every guy my age is wearing one, and even guys a little older than me are wearing them. He was dressed in a, a camel-colored three-piece wool suit. He had a walking cane with a, an ornate handle, and he, he stands up in the back, and he puts his cane down on the floor, and he puts his hands on both sides of the on the, both hands on his cane, and he says, Young man, do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? It had a W in the middle, that word. And I, because I was fresh out of seminary, I was able to paraphrase the words of John Calvin to the effect that by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the community of the church and so forth, that the Bible does, in fact, become the Word of God. And he said, Yes, but do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? And at that point, I did something that I was able to do in those days, which I can no longer do, which was I actually quoted John Calvin um, in his own words, saying what that, you know, which, you know, in a Presbyterian context, that should be enough, you know? And he says, yes, but do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? And I looked at him and, you know, the easy answer would have been yes, because in my own mind it would have been true. But I knew that what was in my mind and what was in his mind were two different things And that so for me to tell the truth would in fact be not telling the truth because it would not be saying the thing that he wanted to know. So I took a deep breath, put my hands on the pulpit, and I said, no. And he just sat down. And then I was excused, and they took a vote, and I came back, and I was applauded, and I answered all the questions, and somebody told me later, it was unanimous except for one vote. (laughs) And honestly, you know, I've always been grateful for that no vote. I think any pastor worth his or her salt ought to get at least one no vote when they're being examined for ordination. So, you know, I am a Presbyterian minister, so why did I feel, what was it about his understanding of the Word of God, which I knew was not mine and which led me to say, no, I don't believe that the Word, the Bible is the Word of God, even though, in fact, I think I do. Because what he was saying was that in these pages, these black marks on these white pieces of paper were the words of God to me. 
And the fact is that we in the Reformed tradition, from John Calvin onward, have had a much subtler and much deeper and more profound understanding of what it means to say that the Bible is the Word of God. We mean something very different than that when we talk about the Word of God. And he wanted this simple equation between this, these pages with those black marks on it and the Word of God, and it's not a simple equal sign between the two of them. Because what we believe is that we have this Bible from the hand of God, and that they reflect thousands of years of the experience of God's people with God. People in different cultures, people who spoke different languages, people who lived in different eras, all reflecting and telling the stories. And that all of that has come together and has come to us from God. But just those words on that paper by themselves is not the word of God. Only when that book opens and is encountered by a believer in the community of the church and with the participation and the presence of the Holy Spirit does that book with its pages and its black ink become the Word of God. That the Word of God in Scripture is A dance between God, between the people of God, between the scripture and its pages, between the believer, the believer's experiences in life, and the Holy Spirit. And when those ingredients all come together, the word of God becomes real, becomes present. I couldn't say all of that in an answer on the floor of Presbytery. So when I knew what he meant and I knew what I meant, I had in honesty and integrity simply to say no. And I think the majority of people on the floor of Presbytery understood, what, at least the pastors, understood what I was saying when I said no. You could read the pages of Scripture. You could read it cover to cover a hundred times and never encounter the word of God. And then on the hundred and first time, if the Holy Spirit joined you in that reading, then you would have your eyes opened and it would unfold to you as the word of God. That's sort of the upshot of what that means. But we mean even more than that when we talk about the word of God. Because when God needed to speak to humanity about God's very heart and God's very nature, there are no words that are capable of carrying that meaning. Not even biblical words can carry the meaning. God cannot just write us a letter and tell us about God's self because our minds could never comprehend it. It can't happen. So when God opened the divine mouth, what came out were not language. What came out was Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal word of God, which John and that ancient hymn of the church tell us was present at and involved in the creation of the universe. What happened when God opened God's mouth to reveal himself to us is that Jesus of Nazareth, who was the embodiment of the word of God by which all was created, that is what was needed for the world to be redeemed and to be saved. The word of God is Jesus, the Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, the Logos, the word of God. And it is only by him that we can know the heart of God. It is only through him being spoken by God that we can be reconciled 
to the God of the universe. And the job of this book, when we open it, take hands with one another, take hands with the Holy Spirit, and submerge ourselves in it, the purpose of this book is to take us by the hand and lead us to the foot of the cross, to encourage us to look up at the God-man who suffers there. It's the job of this book to lead us to the door of the empty tomb and to understand that the God-man has destroyed the power of death. That is what this book is for. But it is the risen Christ who gave himself, who has the power to transform us. And it is he that we have come into this room today to encounter. Scripture leads us to that encounter. The Holy Spirit empowers that encounter. We cannot engineer that encounter. We cannot make it happen. We can create spaces where it can happen if God wills for it to happen. But we come here to worship in order to encounter him, to be changed by him, to be made worthy by him, to be servants in the world of God. Which is why in our worship, the word is at the center of the worship service. The word written, the word proclaimed by the pastor and the musicians the lay readers, the word sealed by the sacraments, and the word incarnate when Jesus appears in our midst to nurture and nourish us. That's what we come for. Sometimes we experience it here. But our job in this service of worship is to create the space together where God can come amongst us and change us from what we were into what he would have us be. We are, in fact, and our worship says it, we are, in fact, a people who are rooted in grace, growing in Christ, reaching out in love. And, in fact, that mission statement of yours is also an outline for the nature of our worship and where it leads. Thanks be to God.